When you think about the last school year, do you feel like your child regressed or fell behind academically? In spite of the truly heroic efforts of teachers and parents, many people are viewing 2020 as the year of lost learning. But the loss wasn't just academic. In fact, the biggest hit may be in social, executive function, and peripheral learning, all of the things that students learn incidentally by being in a classroom and, and having to work with other students. Intentionally helping our children and teens build skills in these areas is going to be more important than ever before. And our guest, Sarah Ward, is just the person to give you guidance on how to do that. This is LD Expert Live. Welcome to LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning differences, dyslexia, and attention challenges. I'm your host, Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers and author of At Wit's End, A Parent's Guide to Ending the Struggle, Tears, and Turmoil of Learning Disabilities. This book will help you understand why some bright children and teens struggle in school and what can be done to change that permanently. To get a free copy, go to parentsatwitsend.com. Let's say hello to Lauren, our moderator and the Director of Clinical Growth and Operations for Stowell Learning Centers. Good morning, hello. Lauren. Good morning. Hello to everyone who is watching us live. Let us know that you're here and where you're checking in from all over the country. We love to see all the places where people are viewing live. Um, be sure to post your questions and comments for the guests today and for Jill about executive function. And I know this is a hot topic. We have so many parents who contact us about their child's executive function. So be sure to post those questions. And what we want to know from you is what is your child's biggest challenge with executive function? Be sure to post that in the chat and we'll check back in in a little bit. All right. Thanks, Lauren. If you're just joining us, this is LD Expert Live. I'm your host, Jill Stowell. Our guest today is Sarah Ward. Sarah is a certified speech language pathologist and internationally recognized authority on executive function. She has consulted with over 1,600 schools on the programs and strategies she has developed with her co-founder, Kristen Jacobson. Their 360 Thinking Executive Function Program received the Innovative Promising Practices Award from the national organization, CHAD. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, you're so right. This is a hot topic with kids having been in remote learning and anticipating the transition back to school. So really excited Absolutely. to be here today. Well, we are delighted to have you joining us today at Stowell Learning Centers. We're big fans of your work. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so this past year has certainly been one full of changes and transitions. What impact do you think this has had on students' executive function? Um, I think it's had a lot of impact and not all doom and gloom. For some kids, it's actually been a bit of a positive impact. Um, I think that students have had to be more and more independent with their learning. Uh, they've certainly had to be able to log on on time, be able to manage breaks, get back. And some students, they learned to do that and did it quite well. Um, on the other hand, it's had a bit of a negative impact. Um, really from a variety of reasons that I think are really interesting and also reflect what we do when we do this thing called executive function skills. Um, and so just to share a couple ideas of what that is. Um, so for example, while all of you are here and you're hanging out and you're listening to me, uh, I pretty much guarantee you have this thought bubble or this movie going through your head 
where you're planning what's going to happen when you're done listening today. Or even while you're listening to me, you might think, okay, I need to run into the other room. I need to put the laundry into the dryer. I need to walk the dog. I've got to check a report this afternoon. Oh, and I should take hamburger out of the refrigerator to thaw because we're having burgers for dinner tonight. <laughs> and as you run that movie through your head, it's what allows you to be what we call a beat ahead. It's what allows you to say, okay, the minute you stop this show, you're headed straight for the laundry room. And as soon as you leave the laundry room, you're going right to the freezer to take the hamburger out. Uh, think about your own children when you say to a child, okay, it's time to get up this morning and we need to get ourselves dressed and go downstairs and make breakfast. Or if the child's eating breakfast and you say, go upstairs, you need to grab your homework off your desk and get your backpack and brush your teeth. You're expecting that student to be able to visualize going up the stairs, into the bedroom, getting the homework off of the desk. Many students with weak executive skills, they don't do that visualization of the future. And that's why you might say, go upstairs, go upstairs. And the child gets upstairs and you pass them upstairs and find them on the floor playing with Legos or sitting on their bed reading a book. Uh, they may not carry out that future task. So back to the big picture of how it's impacted in school, one thing with the pandemic is when children are in school, they're really learning to do this forethought aspect of executive function skills. So when they're sitting at their desk and the teacher says, okay, class, you're going to need a whiteboard and your math manipulatives and a pencil, that child has to envision, I'm gonna go over to that area and get my whiteboard, I'm gonna to go to the math zone and get my manipulatives, and I'm gonna return back to my desk. In the pandemic, two things happened. One, if a student was at home, they didn't have to transition far away to gather materials. They were just sort of staying in one place by the computer. Uh, those high schoolers didn't have to think about, okay, I've got to go down the hall and remember to bring my homework to turn into that class. They weren't necessarily practicing that. In the classroom, if students were not remote, it was the case with social and physical distancing teachers were bringing materials to the students. Students weren't getting up and transitioning to music class. The music teacher was coming to them. So the very forethought aspect of executive skills that children needed to be practicing, they might not have been practicing it. And so this is gonna become a bit of a lagging skill. And that forethought is critical to being able to carry out tasks over space and time. So that's a big thing we wanna make sure that we're working on. And, and I want to talk a little bit more about that because that is so critical. And as adults, we may not even think about the fact that as we plan, you know, we plan out our time or our day, we're most, you know, we're visualizing. We have that movie going on. Yes. So how can parents start building this skill in their children? Such a great question. So the number one thing is, is that I love what you just said, that we as adults are often visualizing. So when you're a parent and you give a direction to a child, go upstairs, get your shin guards and your soccer ball and come downstairs for soccer practice. You're actually the one that's doing the visualizing, right? You're the one picturing the child going up the stairs into their bedroom, etc. And Typically in that circumstance, you're gonna to have to give the direction two, three, four times, go upstairs, go upstairs, don't forget your shin guards. And they may get the shin guards come back downstairs and you go, where's the soccer ball? And then they have to go back upstairs. We kind of call that the zigzag behavior. We wanna reduce that. So there are several really cool strategies that you can do. One is, is that we do visualize over space and time. And that's very important to understand. So if you're in the kitchen, you visualize yourself in your bedroom, which is down the hall and up the stairs. Uh, if you're at your desk, you visualize yourself turning something in. It might be driving to school and walking in the building. So as a parent, here's a cool tool. Don't give your child the direction and say, go upstairs, brush your teeth, put on your pajamas and pick out a book. Instead, stop your child at the bottom of the stairs and say, it's time for bed. When you go upstairs, what do you see yourself doing? And you can use a nifty phrase called point out your plan. 
Now, pointing out your plan is actually really critical because we want that student to use their hand and gesture. Well, I'm gonna go into the bathroom and brush my teeth. I need to go into my bedroom and get my pajamas and then pick out a book. One thing we know is that gesture really helps us to imagine how we're traveling through space and time. And it's something very specific. It's called representational co-thought gesture. So if you have finished the morning routine with your child and you're down the hall, instead of saying, go get breakfast, and you're thinking about that, stop the child at the end of the hall and say, it's time for breakfast. What's your plan in the kitchen? And you want that child to be able to say, well, I've got to go into the kitchen. I'm going to get Cheerios out of the pantry and milk and make myself a bowl of cereal. Now, if you're having a little bit of an eye roll moment and thinking, okay, I don't think I can get my kid to do that. It's okay in the sense that what you want to really tell your child is, hey, you're working on organization. You're working on planning skills. And when people plan, they visualize what they're going to do and they imagine where they're going. So we're just practicing that imagination skill and really tell them why they're doing it. So always have your child point out their plan. So if they've just finished breakfast and it's time to get out the door, say, okay, we're headed out the door, point out your plan to be ready to go. And again, you want that child to say, well, I need to go to the mudroom and get my backpack and I need to put on my shoes and I need to stop in the kitchen and grab my lunchbox. Have them point out their plan. Now, the second strategy is something that always really surprises people um, because typically in the world of executive function, there's always this high recommendation to give the child a checklist, you know, give them a checklist of what it is that they need to do. But there's two sort of inherent tricky things about that that will make the checklist uh, not necessarily always work, number one. And number two, it makes the child a little bit dependent upon the checklist and not learning and carrying over a skill. So the thing is, when you give your child a checklist of things to do, typically you as the parent envisioned the tasks and then gave a label to it and put it on the list. But the big thing that we know that I've been chatting about is that executive function always starts with that visualization and forethought. And that's something called nonverbal working memory. And I always laugh because as a speech pathologist, I feel as though I never am quite without my tools. So I always have like my favorite thought bubble. So the whole idea is that we want students to really be able to do that visualization of, oh, okay, well, what am I going to look like? And so if I see myself ready, what does ready for school actually entail? It means that I'm fully dressed. It means that I have a headband. It means that I have my lunchbox, my snack, whatever. I really have to see that in my mind's eye. If you give me a checklist, I may not be visualizing the gestalt of what I look like, but rather what I'm doing is I'm reading a list of words. So one of the best things that you can do is take a photograph of your child and print that photograph out and put it inside a plastic sleeve protector. So if you have a photograph, get your child fully dressed for school one morning. And especially when we're going back to school, this is the perfect time. You can get that back to school, third grade, fourth grade, eighth grade picture, whatever it is, and try to get a little bit of a side view so that the child can see the materials they need in their hands, their backpack, their coat on, their shoes tied, whatever it might be. And that way, one of the things that you can do, and again, it's a little bit of a magic phrase, you wanna pull up that picture and say to your child, time for school, show and tell me your plan to match the picture. And that show word is very important because the show, again, encourages the student to actually show you with their body. Oh, well, if I have my backpack, then I need to go into the mudroom and get my backpack. If I see my lunch in the picture, I need to go into the kitchen and get my lunch. They tend to point out their plan. Now, the reason why we love to put this inside a plastic sleeve protector is that we actually want this photograph to be dynamic and not static. We don't want a photograph to hang on the wall. We don't want it to become wallpaper because the fact of the matter is every day you have a routine decision that you need to make. And a routine decision is getting dressed. And you all do that very easily. You know that means you put on undergarments and a top and a bottom and shoes and you may or may not have outerwear and accessories. 
On top of that routine, you make a complex decision. Now the complex decision is, well, what is the weather like today? Or what future event am I going to? And how will that change what I'm going to wear? How will I look the same but different in that photograph? So if you have a photograph of a child who's wearing a short sleeve t-shirt and shorts and sneakers, and we say, this is what you look like, but today it's raining, how will you look the same but different? Same but different is one of the number one ways we develop cognitive flexibility in our students with executive function skills. Well, I would have a raincoat and I would be wearing my rain boots. I might say to a student, gee, today when you go to school, you have your physical education, your PE class. How do you need to look the same but different? Oh, I really have to remember to wear comfortable leggings and long um, socks. So I'll look the same but different. My closing point being that photographs allow for cognitive flexibility. They allow a student to see the gestalt and to really do that planning and to create that mental forethought whereas the checklist just can't do that. And a photograph is more biologically enduring uh, as Jessica Minahan, who's an expert on anxiety will tell you. It allows you to really hold on to information for a significantly longer period of time. So it's a cool tool. Wow, that is, that is just brilliant. And I encourage parents, you're gonna maybe be listening to this and think, wow, I don't, I don't feel like I have time for that. We're so busy. We have to, you know, get to all the activities. I have to get everyone online or I have to get them all to school. What you are building with these tools that Sarah just talked about, you are building memory and comprehension and their independence. This is, this is what our executive function does all the time, all day. And by taking That's just right. that little bit of time, to, to stop and have your child picture and talk through their plan, you're setting in, in motion all kinds of skills that they need for life and for school and learning. So that was just brilliant. I'm gonna encourage everybody to go back and listen <laughs> again and again and share it because that yeah, is I mean, tremendous it, stuff. I was gonna say two other great things of photographs. Um, if your child has a backpack or an activity bag for swimming, uh, field hockey, whatever it is, take everything out of the bag, lay out what goes grouped together. So you might have um, a pile of the binders, you might have the books, the academic agenda planner, and then take a photograph of it. In younger children, we print that photograph and we make a luggage tag out of it so that a child can just look at the luggage tag on the backpack and see what a packed backpack looks like. That's also really great for families, maybe from a divorced family where the child's going from home to home, then that image is always there on the backpack. Another great thing, think about how many times we say to a child, oh, before you come upstairs, clean the living room or don't leave the kitchen table a mess with your homework or you need to clean your bedroom. If you really want the child to clean the bedroom, you're the one that has the image of what clean bedroom looks like. You're the one that has the image of what the living room looks like or the clean bathroom. Take a photograph of it, have the bathroom clean, get a photograph and say, hey, before you leave the bathroom, match the picture. This is what it looks like. And that makes it much easier for the student to glance and go, oh, it's not that big of a deal. I'm just taking those things off the, you know, the." coffee room table, whatever it might be. Helps a lot. It it really does. That's that's a great tool. Great tool. So uh, I want to talk about another piece. Uh, with online schooling, there was a real concern with the mental health implications of lack of connection and kids missing their friends. And in addition to this, and you kind of talked about this a little bit, there's a great deal of what we call peripheral or incidental learning that goes on in a classroom or on a playground that contributes to shaping behavior and social skills and decision making. Uh, I would love for you to talk a little bit about what what you've talked called situational awareness and how critical that is. Absolutely. So uh, one of my favorite things to share is that, and this I always think is a surprise to people, 
there is not a high correlation between IQ and executive function. In fact, oftentimes we find a student who's struggling with executive function challenges and we say, oh boy, let's send this child out and let's do some evaluation. And often uh, I would say it's the case more than not, the child comes back with average if not significantly above average test scores and sometimes doesn't even qualify for services. And sometimes my very, very bright students often have the worst executive skills. So even though there is not this strong correlation between IQ and executive function, there is a 100% correlation between SQ and executive function. And I always love to share that because so many times people will say, okay, I know what IQ is, I know what EQ is, but SQ, yep. SQ is situational intelligence. And situational intelligence is essentially our situational awareness or what we just call the stop and read the room skill. And there are four features of situational awareness which actually conveniently match the acronym STOP for stop and read the room. Those four features are space, time, objects, and people. So in any one given moment in time, we are always situationally aware of the space that we are in, where am I? We're often always aware of what time is it? What time is it now? By what time do I need to transition? What pace do I need to keep in order to make that transition on time? We are aware of the objects that we have and need, and we are aware of people um, in two distinct ways. We're aware of others and we are aware of ourselves. So when we read the room, we're often looking around to see, well, what are other people doing? But we also need to be aware of our own actions, and we call that being aware of role, like what's my job right now? So again, in summary, in any one moment in time, we are aware of where am I, what time is it, what objects do I need, and what's my job right now? Now, not only do we do that in the moment, but we also do that significantly when we transition. So if I'm a student and I'm walking down the hall and I transition through the doorway into my classroom, I need to be able to scan that space and stop and read the room. Okay, space, I'm in my classroom. What's happening in this moment in time? Oh, kids are turning in homework. I also need to be aware of those typical time parameters, like what usually happens at the start of class or what do we usually do at nine o'clock, et cetera. And I have to read the room for objects. Oh, everyone is taking out their laboratory notebooks and they're turning it in. And I interpret that as role or job. Ah, their job is to be a homework manager. And your ability to read the room literally occurs in the blink of an eye. It's been measured to happen in a nanosecond so that the minute you walk into a room, you can get that gestalt and go, oh, OK, great. Everyone's turning in their homework. I better take out mine out of my bag and turn that in. Individuals where they're not naturally and or quickly and efficiently reading the room those are the kids that uh, walk into a room and they tend to notice the fluff on the floor. They notice someone else's t-shirt. They think that's a cool water bottle. And then they see some chemicals that are out on the lab table. And they think those are really cool and wonder what they could do with those. And they sit down and they don't take out their homework. And this is the student who gets home. And as the parent, you go, honey, don't you remember this morning we unzipped your backpack? Together we put your lab report in the backpack. We talked about you turning it in. I just went onto Google Classroom and it's showing up as a missing assignment. Why didn't you turn it in? And this student will genuinely look at you baffled and go, well, the teacher didn't ask for it. Well, that's true. But the teacher doesn't always have to ask for it. You need to be able to read the room. Uh, another really great example of this, um, maybe you're cooking dinner and you have the table half set, all right, and there's maybe a few placemats out and tables and it's clearly water's boiling away on the stove. And this is a child who walks in with a bucket of craft materials and places it on the kitchen and says, hey mom, can you help me make a diorama? <laughs> and you think, well, yes, but not now, like read the room, this is not the right timing. And so one of the things is, is that situational awareness is one of the core underpinnings of executive function because it's what guides your planning. It's what allows you to say, well, gee, if this is what's happening now, then that 
accesses that forethought, then this is what I need to look like, or this is what I need to do. So it's one of the bases of self-regulation. So uh, there's a lot of things that you can be doing to actually naturally build situational awareness, but it's a huge underpinning that we have to make sure that kids really do focus on. Um, and so I'm happy to share a few of those strategies, but I wanted to just give you a chance Jill, to jump in. <laughs> That's kind of what situational awareness is. Well, and, and, you know, because these are things that we as adults, we do, we do it all the time. If we're managing in our lives and our work and our kids, we're doing this. And, and as you said, we're doing it in a blink of an eye. So it's kind of like we, we never really stop to think, oh, I might need to teach my child some of these skills. Um, and, and so just you bringing it to our awareness, I think is really helpful. And I would love for you to share <laughs> uh, how parents can help their kids get better at reading the room. You bet. So there's um, kind of a number. So if we think about it as being space, time, objects, and people, let's start with space. So one of the number one ways is that when we walk into a reading room, we tend to read a room from the wide angle to the narrow angle. So we naturally think of a room as having kind of zones, even though they're not really mapped out that way, everything does tend to be organized in zones. Um, even in a uh, just kind of a holistic broad way, if you think about uh, a Target store, every time you go into a Target, whether you're going to a Target in Arizona or a Target in Massachusetts, they're all sort of organized the same way. There's the beauty product zone, the pet zone, then there's the food zone, et cetera. We tend to have the same thing. So in your kitchen, for example, there might be the pantry zone, there's the food prep zone, uh, maybe there's the eating zone, et cetera. Oftentimes what happens is when kids struggle to read a room, they're not really looking at it in those kinds of zones. The reason why that's a problem is, is that it means you're not efficiently planning. So if you think about a classroom, if I understand a classroom is organized, there's the homework zone, there's the math zone, there's the teaching zone, and there's the help zone. If my teacher gives me the direction, okay, you're going to need your materials and your math manipulatives, then my brain naturally will say, oh, well, I'm going to need to go to the homework zone to get my materials, and I'm going to go to the math zone to get my manipulatives, and then I'll come back to my desk. Helps me visualize how I'm moving from point A to point B. So two easy tricks with space. Number one, I would say really talk about the zones that are naturally present in your house. So if you walk into the child's room, you can say, oh, there's your dressing zone and just focus on the area in front of, say, the closet or the bureau where the child dresses. There's your sleeping zone. Focus on the area by the bed. There's your homework desk zone. And this is one that I think is an important one for a lot of middle and high school students. Refer to something called sort of their drop zone. Uh, as adults, we all have a drop zone, and it's usually the corner of the kitchen counter where when you come in and you have the mail and the keys and things, you tend to drop it in a drop zone. Now, the reason you do that is because you're transitioning, but also because if you want to get back to something and you know, where did I put my phone? You're naturally going to look at that first place in the drop zone. So teach your child to not drop their phone, drop their keys all over the house, have a dedicated drop zone. That's going to help with reading the room as well. So if you're looking in the pantry and your child needs to be making a decision about what to eat, naturally just talk about it. Oh, there's the canned food zone. There's the cereal zone. There's the snack zone. There's the paper products. Really just be naturally labeling it. That's going to teach your child how to kind of look at the room and then narrow in and focus on specific areas. So that's number, one of the number one ways that we really teach kids to pay attention to space. Label those zones. It makes all the difference in the world. And then my next favorite one is how do we help kids be aware of time? Uh, and I'm going to jump in here and show you some of my favorite things. Now, I always have my tools around. So 
The thing about time is time is generally invisible. So if you say to your child, uh, okay, it's 3.30 and we need to leave the house at 3.45, again, there's two problems with that. Number one is most kids hear that as it's 3.30 and we need to leave at 3.45. They hear the words, they don't visualize the volume of time. But I've been sort of emphasizing executive function is all about visual forethought. We need to be able to see what something's going to look like. So if we're going to teach time, there are two ways in which we teach kids to be situationally aware of time, knowing what time is it now. And then secondly, how do we teach kids to be aware of the transition? By what time do I need to leave or what do I need to do differently um, to manage my time? So to do that, we recommend two specific things. We recommend that you have two clocks in your living areas. And here's what I mean by that. Most people have a clock on the wall, except the problem is it's typically digital. So if you're in the kitchen, we look at the microwave or the oven, it's digital. If you're in the living room, you tend to look at the cable box, it's digital. If you're in your bedroom, you look at your alarm clock, it's digital. The problem with digital time is that it will give you the hour of the day, but it does not show you the volume of time. So trick number one, we love to have analog clocks in the house and we call them wall clocks. Now we call them wall clocks, not because they're hanging on the wall, but because we're gonna differentiate it from a second type of clock. So I encourage you get an analog clock in a location in your house that can be easily referenced by multiple rooms. So if you have one that's kind of in that open space um, in the living room that can also be seen by the kitchen, that's a great place to have it. And make sure it's not Roman numeral. Um, our, sometimes we naturally have uh, decorative clocks, but our kids can't read Roman numeral. Uh, have an analog clock in the dining room, or, or not, excuse me, in the kitchen. If you can get one like a little, you know, analog kind of alarm clock in their bedroom, let's get that in there too. And all you want to do is start to say the wall clock says it's 115. Oh, our wall clock says that it's 220. And get kids used to referencing it. Did you know, I just find this fascinating, one of my um, kind of informal evaluation questions when kids come in to my office and I'm evaluating them and I'll say, if you were standing in the kitchen and you didn't know what time it was and you didn't have your phone, where would you look? It's amazing to me how many kids don't naturally see the microwave, the oven. They'd be like, um, uh, I'd ask my mom. They don't they don't naturally walk into a room and are just constantly checking what time it is. Whereas I think you and I are always keyed into, we're glancing, oh, it's 12.15. Okay, now it's 12.25. Oh, it's 12.35. We're keying into it. Start to really get your kids to just keying into where are those time tools. Now, the second one, this is really cool, is we recommend you have a second analog clock. Uh, for those of you that are listening and not viewing me online, I'm holding up just a classic, you know, analog clock. We call these the working clock. Now, it can be the same clock that hangs on a wall, but I don't recommend you hang this analog clock on the wall. You want to have it on the kitchen table where kids do homework, and we call it the working clock because it helps us gauge our work. You want to have it in the child's bedroom. You want to have it in the bathroom if that's where the child goes. And if the child goes in the bathroom and disappears for 40 minutes, or if the child goes into the bathroom and spends hours getting ready or takes too long of a shower and needs to take a quick shower, that's where that working clock is going to go. But we're going to do something different with the working clock. Um, my working clock has a glass face, which I encourage you to use, and you can use a dry erase marker. Now, the value of doing that is that you can take the invisibility of time and you can make it explicit and visible. So the first thing you're going to do is you're just going to shade on the clock. So my clock says right now um, 1025. I'll make it just a little bit clearer. And I'm going to put my marker, my dry erase marker in the center of the clock. And I'm going to draw right on top of the clock face down the minute hand to 1025. And I can say to my student, we have 20 minutes until we need to leave for soccer. So we're going to leave in 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. And what I'm doing is I'm shading in that 20 minute pie 
and volume of time directly on the clock. Because now I've taken that invisibility of time and I've made it completely visible. The other thing that you can do is not only can you make time visible, but the other thing that you can do is you can plan time. So now what I'm doing is I'm taking a different colored dry erase marker and I'm writing on the clock what the student might do. So here's where I can say, okay, you're going to get dressed for soccer and then in for the first 10 minutes, they're gonna get dressed, dressed. And in the second 10 minutes, I'm just writing the words pack bag. So that that way the student can see, oh, okay, I really have 10 minutes to get dressed and then I have five minutes to pack my bag. And it is a working clock in the sense that it has a battery and it's working which means the minute hand is going to be moving underneath that shaded area of time. And that is so fantastic because it develops metacognition for time. Now the student is able to look and see, oh my gosh, this is how much time I have left. Similarly, it allows them to look back and say, wow, how much time did I use up? And what was I doing? Was I actually getting dressed or was I petting the dog or was I playing with Legos? So it allows them to see how they're using their time because I can't tell you how many kids, they're, they're lost. They don't even have a sense of the passage of time because so many students guess time based on emotion, based on the actual mm -hmm. passage of time. And if you're sitting on your phone doing Instagram or Snapchat, whatever it is, boy, you can lose 20 minutes without any awareness that 20 minutes is gone. So shade on a clock to increase that situational awareness of what time is it now and by what time do I need to leave? Other things that you can do, you can take a post-it note and you can put post-it notes on a clock to indicate what tasks a child needs to do. And with that, one of my favorite things is to create a check-in. So if your student is doing homework and we wanna make them situationally aware, I can actually put a post-it note, and if you're not watching uh, the video live, I'm putting a post-it note on the clock. I can write that I'm gonna start my math homework. I can put a post-it note at the end of, say, the 20-minute volume of time, and on that, I can write what my goal is. So I can go ahead and show here that my end goal is to have answered 10 math questions. And then what we love to do is also to sort of put that post-it note at that midpoint check-in so that at my midpoint, I want to have between three and five problems done. So that as time passes, if I get to a midpoint and I'm not at my midpoint goal, I can check in and say, well, why am I not? Or what's going on? Am I distracted? Do I need help? How long should I stay stuck before I ask for help? So drawing on a clock is one of the number one ways to create the invisibility of time and make it visible. Um, I'll pause there for a moment, but I definitely want to give you a few other uh, strategies for situational awareness too. Well, these are these are just brilliant things and I'm so excited about everything you're saying. And I'm thinking, and, and of course it all resonates with me because we, we work with students with these kinds of skills all the time. If you're a parent listening and you've always thought about, you know, time being taught in math class in school on math worksheets and, you know, all of these, amazing suggestions that Sarah is giving us. First of all, you can listen to this over and over, and I would encourage you to do that because it's gonna allow you to just start to think a little bit different and give you ways just in your daily life to, to stimulate them, to picture it, to think about their plan, to, to look at clocks. Um, but also I would say to you, look, just Think about, you know, if there are a number of things that, that you wish your child would be able to manage better, prioritize them, take your top one, and then pull out a tool that you're getting today and start applying that. So, um, you know, these are life skills are going to go on forever and ever. So, so start with one, really start to think it, apply it just in your daily life. And uh, it will have, you know, over time, you're going to have a real impact 
on memory and attention and executive function and and independence. So, um, you know, I, I don't want people to feel overwhelmed. I'm just like a puppy wagging my tail here. I'm so excited <laughs> about everything, but, but you know, right. it's okay to start with one thing. Absolutely. And you, you can start with one little thing of just even shading on the clock and no big deal because um, I know someone asked, they said, well, gosh, what do you do if a child can't even read an analog clock? And part of the thing too is, is that it's not even just reading an analog clock, but think about the language of time. The number of times that we say, honey, we're leaving at a quarter of, or your friend's going to be here at 20 after, or you have until 10 to to play your game and then you need to get dressed. We're picturing what 10 to looks like. We're picturing what 20 of, and some of our kids, that doesn't mean anything to them. So when you just take the time to shade on a clock, even if your child can't read the analog clock, they can't read time, they can certainly see that that volume and that pie of time. They can see, oh, okay, that's a good half hour to do that, or that's a good 20 minutes to do that. But one other thing that I would mention is, is that there is a um, fantastic little curriculum called, uh, by a company called Ainsley Labs. It's spelled A-I-N-S-L-E-E -E, Labs. And it is the only little curriculum that I've ever seen that has taught kids how to read an analog clock very quickly. So, um, you know, the thing that's really, really great about it is, is that um, uh, I have kids who, I mean, I'm talking even college, I have high school, uh, middle school students who've never been able to read an analog clock. And using this little curriculum by Ainsley Labs, which teachers can, or parents, teachers and parents can buy it. I mean, I think it's like $11, it's not expensive. Um, I can get kids reading an analog clock in about 15 minutes flat. It's just a very unique, brilliant way of teaching time. So I definitely encourage you to check that out. Um, so that's one big thing about time. Now, I love too, Jill, that you were like, oh my gosh, what do you do if you're a parent and you're thinking, okay, I don't know if I have time to take a photograph. I'm not sure. What if I'm somewhere and I can't just whip out a clock What or I can't just whip out a picture? What do I do? Well, I have a little magic trick and my magic trick is also related to that last part of situational awareness, space, time, objects, and people. I want to give you a magic trick and how do you help your child uh, tune into their role in a specific space. So this magic trick is something that we call job talk and boy, does it make a big difference. So one of the things that we do as parents and as educators is we're always giving our kids action directives. Let me give you an example of an action directive. Pack your bag, clean up the floor, empty the dishwasher, make your bed, brush your teeth. Now, when you say all of those things and you say, make your bed, brush your teeth, the fact of the matter is, you're the one picturing the child brushing the teeth. You're the one picturing the child making their bed. So the magic trick is you want to change the action, make a bed, pack a bag, which is a verb, and turn it into a noun. Now, there's a very easy way to do that. We call it the er strategy or job talk. So you want to put er on the end of everything. So instead of saying brush your teeth, we say time for bed, you need to be a toothbrusher. Instead of saying make your bed, you need to be a bed maker. Instead of saying clean up the rug, you need to be a rug cleaner. Instead of pack your bag, you need to be a bag packer. Now, the reason why that works is the minute I say you need to be a bag packer, I've given you a noun and it makes it easier to visualize. Oh, well, what does a bag packer look like? What does a bag packer do? Where do I need to go? What objects will I need? It naturally encourages students to visualize that task. So it's such an easy trick and it has a huge, huge impact. Try it tonight. If you're home, say to your child after bed or after dinner, okay, we're all done with dinner. I need you to go be a toothbrusher. Uh, could you mind helping me out? Would you mind being a table clearer? Just put ER. Okay, but the only little thing is, 
don't overuse this magic trick because your kids will be on to you. You have to sort of <laughs> spread it out a little bit, but I promise you when you spread it out, it really works. And by the way, there is a phenomenal resource called Make Social Learning Stick. The author is Elizabeth Sauter. Uh, and her book is all about social executive regulation skills. And there's some fantastic tips in there all about job talk as well. So definitely check out that resource for kids and for families. It's terrific. Well, that is fantastic. That is a, a trick that people can try today. Yep. So, a good <laughs> it place works to on start. husbands too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> I will plug that away. <laughs> <laughs> this is LD Expert Live. I'm Jill Stoll, your host, founder of Stoll Learning Centers, and we're talking with Sarah Ward, uh, expert in executive function. I want to make sure that we are able to get to our live audience and just uh, let them participate here a little bit. So let's do that right now. Hello. Yes, we have a lot of people resonating with everything you're saying, Sarah. Um, so I want to make sure and also sharing what their own child's executive function difficulties look like in their home. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, I'm going to, this is going to be rapid fire. Here we go. Just so that everybody gets a chance. Um, and then we have some questions. So Ellie um, is saying that it is difficult uh, for her child to stick with projects uh, that take a longer uh, time span. Um, Karen was chiming in talking about her son who is going into eighth grade, uh, saying that it used to be a challenge for him to remember to bring home materials and textbooks, but now that they've switched schools, it's now knowing it's that time factor, knowing how long an assignment will take. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, part of that is developmental, she's saying, but you know, it, he's, when he's planning and he's doing his work, um, it's kind of caught up with him. And you yeah. know, that like something takes longer than he actually expected. So we definitely have seen that. We have Christine checking in from Colorado, but she is with us in our Tino Center doing, her daughter's doing an intensive uh, with us. So she's visiting, welcome. And she's saying uh, her daughter's biggest challenges are remembering where she puts items, organization of her desk, her bedroom, and knowing how to get started and being ready on time. Um, uh, we have, let's see, Julie checking in. She has a highly gifted six-year-old organizing and keeping things tidy um, yeah. is what they struggle with. Um, let's see. And we have Veronica checking in from California. Their challenge is homework. Um, Leslie saying um, one of their biggest challenges is memory. Um, so so we definitely understand that. We have Lydia saying virtual school was a complete failure for, yeah, for ADHD fine. kids. It made them miserable. It made them depressed, probably because they couldn't feel successful. They didn't have the tools to be successful at that. Um, and she, she just adds, thank you so much for explaining these skill sets because she always knew it was a thing and didn't know the name for it. It's definitely an issue for her family. Um, a lot of parents saying, you know, you're describing my kid. I get it. This is, <laughs> this is, you know, this is what we're dealing with. Um, uh, Alicia saying, we always say my daughter has no concept of time. We tried setting alarms with labels for her, but unfortunately it has no positive results. So I think that, that the strategy that you explained with, you know, using the wall clock um, and, and that analog clock, that's something I know I did when I was a teacher um, many, many years ago. We never had digital because I taught second grade and just the concept of time that's for right. little guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just an essential skill, absolutely. Um, let's see, I wanna make sure I get to. Um, and Sonia is saying, um, they're from Southern California, 10 year old struggles with time and remembering instruction. Um, and so, uh, so absolutely. And we've, we've seen that. So a lot of themes regarding memory and time orientation. So, um, so definitely it's resonating with their audience. And Nell saying um, starting, so initiation. Mm -hmm. I know we hear a lot from parents just initiating, um, approaching the task, just getting started with step one um, is the hardest um, is the hardest thing for a lot of kids. Um, and Gabriella saying executive function challenges have just shown up strongly in fourth grade, new to this and researching like crazy. Yeah, and and would you say that is a lot of times? 
um, where you start to see the breakdown occurring for for students with executive function challenges around fourth grade, 10 years old, nine, around there? Yeah, um, so interestingly, it it changes and that's a, um, a good place to start to maybe answer a number of those questions. And this is something that I think is really fascinating. So um, typically in the younger grades, that kindergarten, first, second grade, the executive function challenges often present as a high level of impulsivity. So the child who has a hard time uh, sitting in whole group instruction where they can't do independent class assignments and be able to finish them, et cetera. And then in fourth grade, it starts to show up as organization of being able to get homework done and get it back to school. And then as you enter the higher grades, it's being able to transition, remembering to turn homework in, remembering to bring homework home, remembering all those things. And then high school, a lot like what someone else said is now it's managing these long-term projects. What's fascinating is, is that when we look at the developmental course of executive function, it's not academic related that makes it harder because we expect academics to get more difficult. I mean, you know, you expect the learning to become more challenging as you go from elementary to middle and high school. But remember that executive function is all about that forethought, right? So I'm holding up my thought bubble again. And the distance between where you are in a moment in time and how far into the future that you can see is something called the spatial temporal window. So it's how far you can see in space and time. So if I'm in my classroom, I can see where I'm going. I'm going to go there and get my whiteboard and I'm going to go there and I'm going to get my math manipulatives and I'm going to come back to my desk. As you get older, you have to picture, okay, I'm at my locker, but I need to go down the hall, up the stairs and down another hallway, and I need to be doing something in science. And then as you get in high school, okay, here's the project, but I have to be doing this group work with my friends, then I have to be doing that PowerPoint, and the final isn't due from two weeks from now. So that distance between where you are and how far into the future you can see Sometimes they call it the time horizon, but I find it's a little easier to think about it as a spatial temporal window, how far into space and time you can see. Students with ADHD, we know that they demonstrate, it's been proven with this, a three to three and a half year delay in that skill. And so they just cannot see far into the future. And that's why if something's due three weeks from now, they're like, whatever, it's due three weeks from now. And it's literally not until 12 hours before it's due that they're suddenly seeing it and feeling it and going, oh my gosh, now it's due 12 hours from now and they're kind of freaking out. So the reason why I bring that up is that developmentally, that's why we see all of a sudden, it's not just put on your sneakers, it's put your sneakers in your bag, remember to take your bag to school, remember to take out your sneakers for gym, remember to put them in your bag and remember to bring them back home. You have to do, hold on to that planning over greater distances of space and time. And that's what makes executive function skills harder over longer grades and distances. However, the really key thing that if I give you any little piece of advice today is, remember, I keep holding up my thought bubble. Executive function is all about starting with a mental visual image of what it is that it's going to look like. So let me answer the question about long-term projects. Typically what happens is kids get a project and we say, break the project into smaller parts. And what kids do with the support of a teacher or parent or not, they may write the steps on a calendar, right? So it might say, make the PowerPoint, um, you know, write the introductory paragraph, write the essay, edit, revise, I don't know. But the thing is, if a child comes home on Monday night and they don't really feel like writing that introductory paragraph, then they just move on to the next day and the next day. I've never met a child who would erase something on a calendar and move that step. So instead, we want to make it visible. A really cool tool is get yourself a big 8 by 11 or 11 by 17 calendar. When a student has a step of a project, make a little sketch of it. If the student needs to write a paragraph, sketch a little paragraph on a sticky note. If the child needs to study flashcards, make a little sketch of flashcards on a sticky note. If a child needs to find a map for a poster, make a little sketch of a map on a sticky note. Then spread the sticky notes out 
on the calendar so that if you come home on Tuesday night and you were supposed to find that map of Spain, because that's what's on the sticky note, but oh my goodness, you had a soccer game that went late and you have a lot of other homework, then you can just take that sticky note and move it to Wednesday. If you don't do the steps on Wednesday, take those sticky notes and move them to Thursday. What happens is the, the child will visually see the impact of procrastination. They will see those steps piling up. So remember executive function is visual. Make it visual and executive function is about a movement. How am I moving? Move those steps, be able to physically manage them. That can really help a lot. Another question I wanna answer was, and I hear this all the time, oh my gosh, my kid just can't estimate time, right? You say to them, how long do you think that will take? The problem is, is that most kids do exactly that. They estimate time and they tend to do it based on emotion. Well, I feel like it'll take me 10 minutes. Oh, I don't know, it'll just be five minutes. You know, like they just kind of go based on like what they want it to be or something. So I encourage you to change your language. Don't ask your child to estimate time. Ask them to calculate time. And we have a formula for this. But there's an easy way to do this. You and I, what we do is we calculate time. So if you are going to, for example, um, I live in Boston, or I live in Sudbury, which is about 35 minutes outside of Boston. So as a matter of fact, I actually have a dentist appointment in Boston tomorrow. <laughs> However, even though it's 35 minutes away, I'm going to give myself an hour and 20 minutes <laughs> because I have calculated it is during rush hour. I have calculated that I need to park my car on a major busy road and there's a pretty darn good chance I'm not going to readily find a metered spot. If I do, excellent. How great for me and I will find time to get a cup of coffee and read on my iPad if I have an extra half hour but I'm suspecting it could take me a half hour to find a parking spot. So the point being what you and I do is we calculate a window of time, what we know to be the minimum of time, what's probably going to be the maximum and where it might fall somewhere in between. How do you teach a child to calculate time? Well, what you want them to do is you want them to calculate the volume of work that they have by the difficulty. So instead of saying, how long do you think that math will take you? You want to look specifically at the volume of math problems. There are 10 math problems. And then ask the child, do you think those are easy, medium, or hard? Now, maybe kids will under or overestimate. I don't know. It's very individualized depending upon the child. Let's say they say they're medium. I usually call easy, medium, hard a one, two, or three. So if medium is a two and there are 10 problems, 10 times two is 20. If each problem takes you two minutes, it's a 20 minute task. So really we call this kind of like the minute estimate or the minute gauge tool. So if I have to do a poster and I need to print three pictures, and I think that might be hard to kind of get the picture and print the picture. And let's say it's five minutes a picture and there's three pictures, five times three is 15, I'm gonna calculate 15 minutes. If your child needs to clean their bedroom and there's shirts on the floor and they're kind of throwing this, you know, fit over cleaning their bedroom, I will use the same thing. I will calculate, boy, I see 10 shirts. A second a shirt, that's a 10 second task. Boy, you need to hang up the towels in the bathroom. A second a towel, that's a two second task. I really love to give the volume and attach an amount and calculate it. So you have 10 spelling words. Those are easy words for you. If each one takes you one minute, that's a 10 minute task. If it takes you two minutes, it's a 20 minute task. If you calculate it like that, ironically, it's almost never inaccurate. It's almost accurate estimation every single time. But we find it helps kids to be more realistic about it. So if a child needs to read the chapter, I'll say, okay, how many pages are in that chapter? 10 pages. Easy, medium, or hard reading? Well, it's my history. It's hard. Okay, if it's three minutes a page and there's 10 pages of reading, guaranteed at a minimum, that's 30 minutes of reading. That's one of the best ways you can just be factually realistic about calculating a volume of time. And I really encourage you to try that. Um, and that makes a big difference. And taking that 
time to do that with your child, it's helping them be aware of time. And, yes. and it's, again, it's something we expect everybody to be aware of, but we don't really teach it. And so I think that's just a great way to tap on that nail all the time to build their awareness and orientation in time. Yep, absolutely. So great, this is so helpful. I wanna make sure, I mean, we do have a lot of parents. We're gonna to try to get to as many of them as we can um, during this time. So Ellie kind of switch, switching gears. Um, she's saying her child has difficulty attending to things that are boring because she has a twice exceptional son, um, but also self-regulation. So she would especially love Sarah's thoughts on number two, how executive function skills impact emotional regulation and what parents can do to address them. Sure. So um, it has a huge impact. And what we know is that as anxiety goes up or as emotional dysregulation goes up, working memory goes down. Now, working memory is this mental thought bubble that I'm talking about. It's that ability to hold in mind what something looks like and what the plan is. So if you're having a lot of negative thoughts and or you're ruminating about something or you're upset about something, remember that anxiety, that emotional upset is going up. It essentially that lower emotional center of the brain will hijack, if you will, the frontal lobe, which means that the child may not be able to access this or may not be able to actually kind of visualize and break down and plan information. It's almost like this just kind of fades away and they kind of become stuck in that anxious moment, if you will. So there's a couple of things to know about that. Um, one is, is that when we have students who are exhibiting kind of high anxiety, on the one hand, what we want to do, and by the way, I just cannot encourage you enough. Uh, the number one authority on the relationship between emotional regulation and executive function is Jessica Minahan. Um, and there's an amazing, amazing article called Helping Anxious Students Move Forward. Um, I'll say that again. It's called Helping Anxious Students Move Forward by Jessica Minahan. Uh, that article won the 2019 Article of the Year Award by the American Psychological Association. It's an outstanding article. Um, but part of it is, is that this, we definitely want to empathize with a child who's feeling anxious and kind of validate their anxious feelings. But also recognize that when they're really sitting there and they're ruminating about all of those negative thoughts, that it's a bit hard for them to sort of get to this. And typically, Jessica really will say, one of the things that we do is we tend to give kids a break. Well, be cautious about what the break is because part of the problem is um, you can do a break where maybe you're coloring or you're swinging or you're doing some sensory break. But the thing about it is, is that you can still be thinking those negative thoughts. Um, one of the best things that you can do to a certain extent is a little bit of the power of distraction, where we want them to be doing something else that's going to engage their cognition on something unrelated to what's upsetting them so that they can shift those thoughts to that and regain some of that working memory. So one of my favorite strategies um, is certainly to validate, but then to really sort of shift and to try to talk about something that is related to that topic. And then I like to really work at giving the student the visual of what it can look like, because I find if I give them that visual, they don't have to pull it up in their own working memory. And oftentimes it's less overwhelming than they initially anticipated it to be. So for example, if you have a student who's really getting overwhelmed by writing and they just can't get started writing those sentences for those spelling words and they're starting to have a tantrum and they're getting all upset, um, I might, instead of just saying, oh, okay, let's take a break, I might give them another cognitive activity to do that they might like, whether it's a word search or something like that. And then you can sort of say to them, so, oh, we're looking at the word search, G, one of your spelling words is this, and maybe you get the sentence started and just ask them to finish it. Because if you get them started, what happens is, is you re-access that cognition and that working memory, and some of that emotional upset disappears. 
Plus, they begin to realize it's just not as bad as I thought. Um, and thank you so much to the Stoll Learning Center for posting the link to that article. It's excellent. Um, definitely check out some of those strategies. I think you'll find it to be very helpful for your students. Um, and then there was another question and, oh, the boring activities. Yep. Um, I find this to be one of the biggest problems is that when students find tasks to be boring or annoying or frustrating, that's one of the number one places that they're going to procrastinate and they're going to kind of push back and they're going to uh, resist doing. The reality is we all have to be tolerating the boring moment. So I have two things that I think are actually important. Number one, um, there is this amazing list of the top 10 predictors of college success. Ironically, not one of the things on the list is academic. Uh, the number one predictor of college success, by the way, is the ability to manage your own sleep hygiene. You have to be able to get to bed, wake up with an alarm and on your own and get the sleep that you need. Uh, sometimes kids go off to college and they aren't doing that skill so effectively. But one of the, I believe it's like number eight, is that you need to have a job before you go to school. And having workability is a very, very important executive skill because the ability to do work, to be able to set the table, to be able to uh, sweep the back deck, to be able to take out the trash is a big executive skill because you have to know, well, what does successful completion of that work look like? What steps do I need to take in sequence to carry out that work? How do I know that I've done the job well? And how do I complete it and tolerate just a boring work activity? Because we all have to tolerate boring work activities. So right back with there with the job talk that I talked about earlier, where we say to kids, OK, be a toothbrusher, um, you know, be a bag packer. Uh, two quick strategies. Number one. I think a cool tool is create a help wanted bulletin board in your house. Literally put up the cork board and have jobs for hire. Make sure if you put a job for hire, you use job talk. Hire a sweeper, hire a pooper scooper for the dog, hire a raker, hire a, uh, you know, a, a driveway cleaner, hire a car washer. Always put that er on the end of it and identify what the job is. You can offer money for it. You could offer uh, points, stars. If you have little kids, hire a box squisher, hire a towel folder, a sock sorter. You can do all sorts of things. But here's the reason why. We want kids to learn to get a job, start a job, and complete a job. That's part one. Part two, uh, all of us do boring jobs. And one of the ways that we do boring jobs is we often associate it with something that's a little less boring. Maybe you watch Netflix while you're folding the clothes. Maybe you have music on in the background. So when kids have to really tolerate a super boring task, I often try to talk with them about two things, either A, how do we make it less boring? Uh, can we pair it with music? Can we pair it with drawing something like that? And or I don't start with a boring task. I start with the forethought. What is the thing that you're looking forward to doing? I want to play Roblox. I want to go outside and skateboard. I want to uh, play with the dog. OK, so what do we need to do to get through this task so that you can go play with the dog? And I'm really constantly focusing on the benefit to them of tolerating the boring task. And I find when you start with the forethought, that's better than just saying, OK, get it done, get it done, and then you can play with the dog. It's just a funny shift. Say to them, oh, you're thinking about playing with the dog? What do we need to do? Oh, you really want to get to the dog? What could we do to uh, make this less boring? Just that forethought tends to close that um, temporal spatial window a little bit. So that's helpful. And it, and it lets our brain anticipate something which increases our mood, gives us a little dopamine boost. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better. <laughs> it's so great. I, we, again, we have so many, um, <laughs> so many questions and I wanted to, um, you know, just make sure that we hit on a lot of our questions are related to some of the things that you've already discussed. And so I just wanted to make sure that, you know, because there's a lot of different challenges that, that parents are facing with their kiddos. Um, 
And so really just quick advice for some of our parents. Um, Mara is asking, I've heard suggestions that when the child has homework in multiple subjects, that they should lay it all out in stations at the table and spend five minutes or so um, in a subject and then rotate to the next subject to pre prevent boredom. What do you think of that strategy? Um, I think that that's really individualized. And here's the reason why. Some students have the ability to shift cognitive set. So if I'm working through calculus, albeit I find it boring, and I can do that for five minutes, and then I can shift my brain and focus on history for five minutes, then I have to be able to come back and re-engage my brain to do calculus. Some students are really good at that. There are other students that if they're in the set of okay, what are the steps and procedures to carry out this particular calculus problem? And then they shift their attention to something new. It's like they have to start at square number one. That new inter information serves as interference for their cognitive train of thought. So I think it, the answer is it really depends upon the student. Um, I just, but, but what I do like is I do find it's very helpful to actually lay out homework for, for students and really help them start with what we call the done goal. So I'm always starting with, okay, if you spent a half hour on homework and you were all done, what does done actually look like? I've done 10 problems. I've done three problem sets. I've uh, read four pages and be very specific. You know, specificity is a superpower. Because what I find is, is that a lot of times we say to kids, go do your homework. What do you have for homework? And we're talking about it. And kids will say, oh, I have English. I have math. I have history. And their immediate sense is, oh, it's going to take me hours. And they're overwhelmed by it. Mm -hmm. If instead we say, if you spent an hour doing math, you know, or if you spent, you know, 10 minutes doing history at the end of 10 minutes, what does done with history look like? And the kid goes, oh, well, I read a paragraph and answered two questions. Then a lot of times they go, oh, it's just not as much as I thought. <laughs> you know, they're, they've built it up to be so much more than it really is. Um, and so I find that to be helpful. Um, so, you know, again, what I would say in just broadly answering that question, I think it really depends upon your child. Mm -hmm. And Perfect. I think it's okay to experiment with your child. I mean, try it out and see, but dialogue together. How did yes. that feel to you doing a little bit and moving to another subject? And and if they say, oh my gosh, I was able to concentrate so much better. Perfect. If they say, oh, I hated having to switch. Okay, well, that's probably not going to work or it's not enough time on each one. But, but that dialogue, I mean, that's what our executive function, that's what our executive function does as we try things out and determine the best way for ourselves. Um, you, know, you just said as you, something triggered something for me, when you said, oh, we try things out for ourselves. Um, there's another new book on the market that I think is really fantastic. Um, I apologize that I don't know the author's name off the top of my head. Um, they originally wrote a book called Unstuck and On Target. And it was a book about executive function and social regulation, um, a little bit targeted towards students on autism spectrum disorder, but not exclusively for that. And it was really about developing cognitive flexibility. But they've just put out a second book called Unstuck and On Target to build executive function skills. Mm -hmm. And wow, is it outstanding. I mean, it's really terrific. Um, I encourage you to check out that new book uh, because it really prepares kids to be cognitively flexible and to anticipate a plan A and a plan B. Because when you and I have that mental forethought where we're anticipating, we're always anticipating, okay, well, we visualize all right, I'm going to go and I'm going to manage the laundry and I'm going to walk the dog and I'm going to. Um, you know, have dinner. And then all of a sudden you go, wait a minute, what if I take out the hamburger and it's too late? There's no way it's going to thaw. Well, if it's not going to thaw, then plan B, I guess we'll just do chicken leftover from last night and I'll turn it into burrito bowls, you know, whatever it is. You're constantly visualizing a plan A and a plan B. A lot of our kids 
some of them aren't even getting the plan A. And so one thing I really love is I think this book does a really nice job of helping students naturally anticipate plan B thinking. And I'd encourage you to check it out. Well, oh, Sarah, thank you so much. I We need to let Sarah go. I really want to keep her <laughs> all day. And I know all of you do too. Um, because this is a, a, a discussion that, you know, is so important. And, and I just encourage you, parents and teachers, you can go back to this over and over and over. Sarah has given you a ton of great resources, which we've put in the chat for you. Yes, thank um, you. So um, I just want to thank you so much. Uh, Lauren, if people didn't get their questions answered, give us a little guidance here about what they can do. So um, absolutely, I mean, same as what Jill said, we have a private Facebook group, Mom Squad, where parents are welcome to join. Um, it, you just need to search Facebook groups or go to our um, Facebook page and search for SLC Mom Squad. That's a community of parents uh, with kids and teens with learning attention challenges. I posted guides and one of the guides is on executive function. I'm gonna repost this episode. I'm going to also independently post a lot of the resources that Sarah mentioned in today's show in Mom Squad, so you can access that and, and you don't have to wade through all the comments um, to find all those really valuable resources. So look out for that in Mom Squad. Um, and then we also have our peace meeting in July is also going to be on executive function. Perfect timing. Uh, July 22nd, that's Thursday, July 22nd at 5 p.m. Pacific time. And we that is really a roundtable discussion with parents, just getting your questions answered related to your child's struggles with executive function and also the anticipation of going back to school. Most of us are going back to a traditional school year and lost a lot of important executive function skills. So we'll be discussing that on July 22nd. Um, and like Jill said, we did post, we posted a lot of the resources in the chat. Um, you're welcome to go back, uh, parents, teachers, a lot of people tuning in, different professionals, um, go back and rewatch the show. So it'll be posted on our Facebook page, on our website under the LD Expert uh, tab um, and on YouTube to go, go rewatch and to share. So thank you. Great, thank you, Lauren. Thank you everyone who participated today. We love having our live viewers pop in and join the discussion. Sarah, this is this has just been brilliant. Uh, what last thought do you want to leave us with today? <laughs> well, thank you again for the invitation. It's been so much fun to be here. Um, my only last thought is just remember executive function is really forethought based. And so the more you can help your children to visualize what it's going to look like and to kind of start with the end in mind and plan backwards, you're going to see a lot of success with executive function. So that would be my big takeaway message. Perfect. Well, this has been really fun. This episode has been just packed. And so be sure and take advantage, everyone, and, and re-listen uh, so that you can grab all this information. Here is Sarah's contact information. Take a screenshot, share her information with your school. She does training for schools and districts all over the country. We focused on parents today, but this is equally ac applicable and helpful to teachers. So be sure and, and share the episode, share her information with your school. This is LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning disabilities, dyslexia, and attention challenges. We're live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific. Next Tuesday, we'll be talking to cognitive consultant Alexandra Dunnison about neuroplasticity and why students who struggle don't have to stay stuck. Be sure to join us next Tuesday at 10. Stowell Learning Centers are open for both remote and on-site sessions and evaluations. Summer is a great time to give students a boost and to get started addressing learning challenges at their root so that students can reach their potential and thrive in school. And our blast off to learning summer theme is so much fun and it's a big hit with both our remote and our on-site students. If you would like a free consultation for yourself or your child, give us a call or visit our website at stowellcenter.com. 
Thank you again, Sarah, for the incredible practical information. I truly would love to have kept you here all day. Thank you everyone for joining us live or on the replay. We'll see you all next week.